and all the elements of our unconscious brought to the light of consciousness and integrated harmoniously into our character structure in the brevity of a human life we can only ever approach but never fully reach the condition of psychological wholeness but moving in this direction generates fulfillment and leads to the cultivation of a character that is rooted in our individuality and which transcends mere social roles and the expectations of our peer group and society at large. For as Jung explains, individuation means becoming an individual, and insofar as individuality embraces our innermost, last, and incomparable uniqueness, it also implies becoming one's own self. We could therefore translate individuation as coming to selfhood, Individuation as a method of self-development offers many benefits over following the well-worn paths of conformity. Firstly, this process makes us more capable in life. For as we aim towards psychological wholeness, we increase the number of skills and character traits at our disposal, and so augment our capacity to take advantage of life's opportunities and to deal with its problems. Individuation is also an effective antidote to diseases of despair. Be it anxiety disorders, cirrhosis, depressions, or certain forms of addiction. For while these conditions can stem from a myriad of causes, one of the most common is an unlived life, or the feeling that we are stagnating in conjunction with a nagging awareness of our ever approaching death. Individuation forces us out of these ruts of being and places us on a life path that is both purposeful and meaningful. A further benefit of individuation is that a byproduct of approaching the state of psychological wholeness is the spontaneous formation of an attitude that affirms life, and which, in the words of Jung, is beyond the reach of emotional entanglements and violent shocks, a consciousness detached from the world. For as Jung writes elsewhere, if you sum up what people tell you about their experiences on the path of individuation, you can formulate it this way. They came to themselves. They could accept themselves. They were able to become reconciled to themselves, and thus were reconciled to adverse circumstances and events. To attain the benefits of individuation requires that we take a step that is simple in theory, but difficult in practice. We must focus our attention southward, and in the most objective manner possible, assess our life and the current state of our character. Wisdom begins only when one takes things as they are, explains Jung. So it is a choosing attitude when one can agree with the facts as they are. Only then can we thrive. A radical self-acceptance is needed to individuate. This entails identifying and accepting our character flaws and weaknesses, but also our talents and strengths. It requires an acceptance of past mistakes and failures and a clear grasp of the core conditions of our life and the recognition that we cannot go forward except from the place where we happen to be. And perhaps most importantly, we need to accept that there exists a vast potential within us and that the possibilities for our development are endless. Or as Jung writes, since the growth of personality comes out of the unconscious, which is by definition unlimited, the extent of the personality, now gradually realizing itself, cannot in practice be limited either. But while self-acceptance is a preparatory step on the path of individuation, it is also a step that in and of itself produces strong therapeutic benefits. In volume 13 of his collected works, Jung quotes a letter from one of his patients about the inner change that occurs when one comes to accept him or herself. Out of evil, much good has come to me. By keeping quiet, repressing nothing, remaining attentive, and by accepting reality, taking things as they are, and not as I wanted them to be, by doing all this, unusual knowledge has come to me, and unusual powers as well such as I could never have imagined before. I always thought that when we accepted things, they overpowered us in some way or other. This turns out not to be true at all, and it is only by accepting them that one can assume an attitude towards them. In addition to self-acceptance, Jung also advocates an increased acceptance of those close to us, particularly our family members. Jung maintained that far too many people waste far too much time 
in the tangles of what he called the boring family drama. Unless we have suffered a traumatic experience that we have yet to come to terms with, it is better to accept any past mistreatment as a given condition of our life. Playing the victim, dwelling in pity or blame, trying to change another or trying to account for why we were mistreated is wasted life. But no matter how much the parents and grandparents may have sinned against the child, the man who is really adult will accept these sins as his own condition, which has to be reckoned with. Only a fool is interested in other people's guilt, since he cannot alter it. The wise man learns only from his own guilt. Practicing a radical self-acceptance in conjunction with an increased acceptance of others places us on the firm ground of reality from which to take the next step on the path of individuation. And this is to adopt the goal or life mission. I have observed, writes Jung, that a life directed to an aim is in general better, richer, and healthier than an aimless one, and that it is better to go forward with the stream of time than backwards against it. Adopting a goal or life mission is integral to individuation, but psychological wholeness is not approached through mere passive meditation. Rather, a constant embrace of challenges leads to the actualization of our potential, and novel experiences bring unconscious content to the light of consciousness, and it is a life mission that generates this full participation in life. What is more, a goal or mission can help pull us from the passivity of a disease of despair by diverting our focus and energy from psychological interest to more constructive and reality-based pursuits. Practical experience teaches us, as a general rule, that a psychic activity can find a substitute only on the basis of equivalence. A pathological interest, for example, an intense attachment to a symptom, can be replaced only by an equally intense attachment to another interest. So as not to be delayed at the step of choosing a goal or life mission, we should realize that there is no single right choice. Psychological wholeness can be approached from many angles, so we just need to find something that is intrinsically rewarding enough to keep us motivated, and challenging enough to create the novel experiences necessary for self-realization. But like all major life decisions, in choosing a mission, we must be the one to decide. We should Thank not you. rely on others to choose for us. 